Hi. Um, I am not going to give a lot of background on uh, how I ended up here uh, with this talk and with this subject. Uh, suffice it to say, I think the material, as I go through it, will explain it. Uh, but very briefly, I don't think we are going to be able to move forward uh, to a universal healthcare system in America without learning how to use cognitive psychology, prospect theory, all the rest um, effectively. Uh, conservatives have been doing this for decades, and uh, I think that if we don't get our game together, we're going to be doomed to failure again. Let's see. So I've been reading a lot uh, in the past few years, uh, and some of these readings go back decades, like uh, George Lakoff, for example. Um, but here's a list of the sources. Uh, I think I have to give a special shout out to Jonah Berger as um, his book, The Catalyst, took all of the things that I've been learning about in uh, cognitive science and put it in a nice structured format for uh, thinking about these problems and how to overcome the barriers uh, with changing people's minds. So uh, here's the resources. Obviously, I can put these uh, some links in the in the, in the uh, description section, and I will. Uh, but if you have any questions or uh, want to find out more, you know, put a message down below and I'll try to answer it. Um, this is from High Fidelity, uh, the Nick Hornby book. Uh, While I've been listening to my gut since I was 14 years old, and frankly speaking, I've come to the conclusion that my guts have shit for brains. This is uh, probably the basis for most of uh, behavioral economics. Uh, this is basically uh, a description of systems one thinking. Uh, systems one thinking is thinking with your gut. And uh, systems two thinking is the thinking we think of when we think of enlightenment thinking, our, our dispassionate reasoned self. Well, unfortunately, our dispassionate reasoned self doesn't make most, our, most of our decisions. Uh, our gut makes most of our decisions, and that is called systems one thinking. And systems one thinking is fast and intuitive, and it is confident, overly confident, according to uh, Daniel Kahneman, who's one of the originators of the theory. Systems two thinking is slow and deliberate. It is uh, more difficult, takes more time, and is less confident, always doubting itself, always trying to make sure it has the right answers. answer. Uh, this is... A, an essential problem with the way we think and it's an essential problem with the way we make decisions and it's why we can be manipulated uh, in uh, especially with things that cause fear or present possibilities of loss and so on but this will become more uh, more evident as we move on through this uh, this is just a slide showing the uh, differences between systems one and systems two thinking and you can pause here and look if you like but uh, we'll keep moving on. The other major problem, aside from the thinking with our gut, is this problem. Faced with the choice between changing one's mind and proving that there is no need to do so, almost everyone gets busy on the proof. Uh, the uh, cognitive psychology term for this is reactance or resistance. And basically, uh, it's what we experience every day uh, in our news bubbles and when we have discussions with people who disagree with us. Uh, as soon as evidence is presented or an argument is made, we immediately shut it down or try to come up with the reasons in our head while the argument's going on about why the other person is wrong. Uh, this is a, a, a chronic problem for all of us, and it's especially a problem when you're trying to convince people uh, on something like universal health care that would be better uh, for everybody. Uh, immediately they have uh, armament, uh, armamentarium of defenses to try to uh, shoot down any idea that you have or any evidence that you have. So as I said, a lot of this comes from uh, Jonah Berger's book, The Catalyst, and, uh, and, and basically a lot of these slides are going to be uh, adapted from his work. And what he talks about is breaking down barriers and how do you break down barriers to that resistance? How do you, how do you get people past the uh, automatic reflex resistance reactance to your ideas and uh, get them to be uh, uh, at least listen to you? 
And one of the key insights he has is ask, don't tell. Um, I think one of the things we see uh, that liberals do uh, famously well is we explain our policies and we have detailed policies when we uh, have convinced ourselves that they are absolutely the correct policies and why don't you understand this, what I'm telling you and I'm telling you the right thing. Um, and immediately when we try to do that, the uh, reactance comes up, people put up their defenses and they shoot down, internally they shoot down every argument you make. Um, so his uh, advice is to ask. Um, you know, I mean, he makes the argument that if people were inclined to think the way we do about universal health care, then they would have already changed their position, right? And they haven't. So ask, why haven't they changed their position? What is it that is uh, causing the resistance? Explore the barriers. Um, have a conversation about why someone disagrees with universal health care. Um, deep canvassing is a technique that's uh, had some research and basically what it means is rather than going to uh, a door and doing traditional canvassing in politics where you, here's my flyer, here's our positions, thank you very much, we'll see you next time. Um, there has been research on doing what's called deep canvassing and what deep canvassing is, is a conversation. And the examples in the literature are, for example, uh, trying to convince people to vote for uh, the California proposition for uh, LBGTQ equality. And the thing that made the difference and changed people's minds and made them keep their minds changed for at least several months of follow-up was creating empathy. Uh, so a person <clears throat> who's doing the canvassing either <clears throat> is a victim of discrimination or can tell a story about a friend who's a victim or a family member or so on and having a conversation about what that means and then that often creates empathy because the person you're talking to is probably in their lives experienced some things that have caused them problems as well um, that's the short version and I'm going to leave it there but, but you get the idea um, I have an idea on how to do that on a larger scale and I call it the Healthcare in America Commission and at some point I'm going to do a video on that. But basically it's a, a, a version of the Kefauver Commission, and I'll put a link to that below too, um, to explain to people, create empathy with uh, panels or discussions. Anyway, more on that later, but I'll, I'll tell you that I think that's probably a very important way to bring a lot of the concepts that are explored in the Catalyst book into the universal healthcare realm and into creating empathy and uh, bringing corroborating evidence, which we'll get to in a little bit. But I, we have to figure out some way to reach people and change their minds. The other important point uh, is that humor melts fear and just being antagonistic doesn't really get you anywhere, right? Uh, but if you can bring humor into the argument, that can be very helpful. And, and the person I've been seeing do this lately is John Fetterman seems to do this pretty darn well. Uh, he injects humor into his arguments uh, and uh, uh, Twitter feed at least and so on. And I think that breaks down resistance too. And um, so it's a very effective tool also. And it, it, it's disarming and charming. So Some of the things that we often forget when we're trying to persuade people uh, to our position is that people want to have agency. They want to make their own decisions. Uh, in the Catalyst book, he gives the example of trying to uh, persuade teens not to smoke. And, of course, the original uh, ad campaign featured heavy-handed you know, fear-mongering about you're going to get cancer, etc., uh, and then they, uh, to make a long story short, they put the teens in charge of actually making the message. And th what they determined was just give the facts and let the person, the teenager, have agency and make the decision for themselves with armed with the facts. And that approach was very effective because you're not telling them what to do. You're saying, here are the facts and what do you think? Uh, we should do or you should do in this case um, and part of that is that people want freedom they don't want to be told what to do they want the freedom to choose and uh, part of the conversation is 
allowing for that freedom, right? You're not telling them what to do. You're making uh, making facts available and trying to make uh, 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 give them agency to make their own decision and bring them around to your point of view, but not forcing them to your point of view. And this is a obviously big deal uh, in the conservative liberal divide about what does freedom mean. And, and that's a, another topic for another day, but um, we'll get there eventually. So another uh, cognitive barrier to uh, making change is uh, the endowment effect. And what the endowment effect is, is that if you have something, uh, you value it much more than the person who doesn't have it. And uh, one good example is uh, when you have a home and you've been living in it for 20 years and you go to sell it, you have attachments to that home and you think it is much more valuable to another person uh, than it really is. And um, that's true of many other things too. Uh, uh, having employer-based health insurance is probably a good example. By having... By being one of those people who has employer-based health insurance, you ascribe it to uh, ascribe to it many positive things that if you didn't have it and were looking at it from the outside, you might not attribute it to. For example, um, I have employer-based health insurance and I'm covered if anything bad happens. But then if you actually start using that insurance and you find out that the deductibles are ridiculous and there's prior authorization and on and on and on, if you looked at it objectively, you wouldn't give it so much uh, uh, endowment, uh, credence. Um, there's also other parts of this, status quo bias. Uh, the late, great Uwe Reinhardt used to say, uh, that everybody's second choice is the status quo, and thus it always wins. If you have, uh, you know, 300 million people with 300 million different ideas of what we should do, everybody's second choice is what it is currently, and so everybody falls back to that, and so things don't get done. The other uh, uh, issue in cognitive science is loss aversion, and uh, the, the great example is if you poll people about um, uh, government-run health care or single-payer or whatever you term it, if you uh, poll on that, it gets very strong approval, you know, two-thirds generally for, for Medicare for all or single-payer. But as soon as you add to that question a second component that you will lose your employer-based health insurance or uh, whatever, uh, any, any, any additional uh, thing uh, added to that question, and the support drops in half. And that's loss aversion. And I have another uh, piece, uh, written piece about that that I'll link to below as well. Um, but loss aversion is very powerful. And um, the idea that you're going to lose anything, even if it's going to be replaced with something better, the idea that you're going to lose something is very powerful. And so having discussions about universal health care, single payer, and part of the conversation is that you're going to lose your employer-based health insurance is a very powerful negative. And we have to keep that in mind as we're breaking down these barriers. The, the example of just what I was showing, uh, talking about, um, do you favor or approve, oppose having a national health plan, sometimes called Medicare for all, 56% favorability. Uh, if you scroll, look down, eliminate private health insurance companies along with that, the positivity rate goes down to 37%, uh, leads to delays in people getting treatment, 26%, threatened, you see it. So yeah, the, this is essentially loss aversion and it's also status quo bias. So uh, it's something we have to account for as we make our arguments. Um, Jonah uh, Berger makes uh, the case for how to overcome endowment. And one of the things he points out is uh, you have to show the cost of an action. Um, and actually, I think there's a, uh, um, a video going around now, John Kerry talking about the cost of an action on uh, climate change many years ago. And he talks about how uh, we keep paying for inaction on climate change with increased uh, 
uh, uh, weather events and flooding and so on and fires, et cetera. And uh, the cost of inaction in that case is extremely high. Um, he gives another example in his book about someone who has all their money in uh, basically a savings account earning, you know, a half percent or less of interest uh, and showing them that if you just invested in something safe like bonds or a, an index fund or something like that, this is what your return would be, showing them the cost of inaction. And I think we can do that with healthcare very clearly because there are so many benefits to uh, overhauling our system. But again, that, that'll be another topic, but, but you get the idea. Um, we tend to not want to change and uh, we need some way to break down that barrier and sh exposing the cost of inaction is one of those, one of those ways. Uh, and this is, uh, so JFK was ahead of all the uh, cognitive psychologists because this was in the early 60s, obviously. Uh, there are risks and costs to a program of action, but they are far less than the long range risks and cost of comfortable inaction. So he was way ahead of the game. Um, it's also important. One of the uh, uh, costs of inaction is uh, financial and economic sustainability. And by financial sustainability, I mean you personally as an individual um, is getting sick uh, sustainable to you. Actually, it really isn't. There was a recent study from uh, uh, looking at uh, cancer patients. And after the first two, uh, two years after a cancer diagnosis, about half of the people had burned through their life savings. That is unsustainable financially. Um, you know, we don't know if we're going to get cancer. We don't know if we're going to get heart disease. But we do know that the cost of getting sick is uh, unacceptable and toxic. Financial toxicity actually is the term they use. Economic sustainability refers to the fact that we're paying now 18% of GDP for health care. And how much more are we willing to go? How much more are we able to go? Um, you know, right now we're paying that 18% and we're rationing care ruthlessly, right? We're rationing it by income. And if you can't afford health care, you don't get health care. So the 18% actually just goes to a portion of the population. Um, and that is obviously far higher, you know, you know all this, uh, far higher than any other country. But it's probably not economically sustainable. But what it is, is politically sustainability. And, and what I mean about that, uh, and this is from Uwe Reinhardt as well, Political sustainability refers, refers to the fact that there are millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars going into the political system to keep politicians voting for the status quo and even making it more profitable. So it is incredibly politically sustainable because of the money flowing into the system. Um, that is a huge problem. And when you ask people what, what the barriers are to healthcare reform, <clears throat> uh, most activists know that it's the medical industrial complex. It is the, uh, the moneyed interests that uh, like things just the way they are. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so unfortunately, it is very politically sustainable. And we have to combat that and uh, talk about the other two, the financial and economic uh, unsustainability. Um, and I think another point, the financial toxicity is unique to America, right? If I get cancer in Germany uh, in two years, I will not have burned through my uh, life savings um, in France, the same, and so on. So that is a cost of inaction, right? The, that, uh, and if you can pair that with loss aversion, uh, that could be a very powerful tool, right? Showing that the financial toxicity of our system if uh, is a great, uh, risk of loss to you and your family. Uh, finally, just briefly, the sunk cost fallacy is that um, we've already spent trillions and trillions of dollars on our healthcare system as it is. Uh, you know, we don't want to waste that money, right, uh, by changing the system. And the analogy uh, that Dr. Berger uses is that, well, if you were, uh, if you had a company and you had multiple divisions and one of the divisions uh, is not performing well, but it's been around for five years or 10 years, um, you're likely to keep it in the budget and you're likely to keep going. However, if somebody came to you and proposed this division 
and said, this division is going to do X, Y, and Z, and these are going to be the returns, you would never green light that. And yet, because we've been doing it, we will keep doing it. So we have to approach the healthcare system in the same way. There's no reason to continue this horrible, inefficient system <clears throat> just because that's the way we have it now. Um, I think that part of the uh, thing we need to do to challenge endowment is to highlight the cruelty in the system because we have a very cruel system. As we all know, if you're in healthcare, if you're a doctor, a nurse, social worker, you've seen the cruelty in the system. Uh, just the easiest example is the fact that we ration by income. And if you don't have a job that pays enough uh, uh, to buy health insurance or a job that comes with health insurance, you're essentially, you know, a healthcare beggar. Uh, you know, you beg for services, you go to the uh, federally qualified healthcare clinic and so on. Um, <clears throat> there's a tremendous human cost to the healthcare system we have in, in the U.S., and I'll, I'll leave that to you, but uh, there's plenty of suffering, uh, plenty of anxiety, uh, plenty of financial cost, and on and on and on. Um, so as part of my way of combating endowment is to make it clear that the thing we're endowing with such positive feelings does not deserve it. And we have to talk, talk about that and highlight that cruelty. Um, and, you know, one of the other ways is to talk about employer-based insurance versus what happens in the OECD, the uh, European nations. Um, as I just pointed out, you know, if you get cancer in a European nation, you're not going to go bankrupt. But on employer-based health insurance, if you lose your job, yeah, you, you could easily go bankrupt. Um, how many know people who have gotten cancer or heart disease, lost their job, lost their insurance, lost their savings? Yeah, it's uh, pretty common. Um, in Germany, no, doesn't happen. Um, another uh, issue is, uh, uh, again, with endowment, how to, how to combat it is, is to change the conversation from what are called market norms to social norms. And uh, Dan Ariely in his book gives the uh, uh, great example of um, if you ask a law firm to do a task for your nonprofit uh, for free, they will almost certainly say yes. If you ask them to do this service for a discounted rate of, say, $25 an hour, they are almost never going to do that. Because what you've done is you've changed from the social norm of some, doing something good for free to a market transaction uh, and paying a discounted rate. And when you switch from social norms to market norms, the internal uh, uh, thinking about them changes drastically. And this is actually the classic problem with healthcare reform. In uh, conservatives' minds, uh, uh, healthcare is a market good and you get what you pay for if you can't afford to pay for it you don't get anything and if you're really wealthy and can afford to pay for a lot you get a lot whereas liberals view uh, uh, healthcare as a social good like education like police protection like fire protection uh, and so on um, social security um, and once the, we engage with conservatives their cognitive mindset is that market norm and ours is a social norm. And we have to bridge that gap and figure out how to get people to think about it as a social norm and frame it as a social norm and not a market norm. And along with, uh, you know, highlighting the cruelty and the cost and so on, we need to make those the new reference points. We don't we can't let the reference points for employer-based health insurance be that, oh, I have health insurance and therefore I'm going to be safe if anything happens to me. That is not the reference point because that is not what happens in America by and large. Um, yes, you may not blow through all your life savings, but if you have a serious engagement with the healthcare system, it's going to cost you in a lot of ways. Um, anxiety, stress, all that stuff, and money. So we need to establish new reference point of what uh, employer-based health insurance means in America. It doesn't mean what we popularly think it means. Um, it is something far different, and we have to highlight that. And I think this is important. 
catalyzing change isn't just about making people more comfortable with the new things. It's about helping them let go of the old ones. And what I've been talking about so far is just that, helping them let go of the old ones. Uh, let me skip to that. So <clears throat> Dr. Berger has another nice analogy, and, and I'll give it to you now. And, and while you're looking at this slide, you'll see what I mean. So in healthcare reform, uh, imagine a football field. As progressive, progressives, we're on the 20-yard line, 10-yard line, goal line on the left of the field. And pro, uh, conservatives are on the 20-yard line, 10-yard line, goal line of the other side of the field. Right, so Newt Gingrich is at the goal line. Actually, he's a touchback probably, but you get the idea. In the middle, between the 20s, are people who are less uh, uh, fixed in their positions, right? And in, in, in particular, the people between the 40-yard lines are much more fluid in their positions. So there's opportunity, as you see on this graph, not to pick off the Republicans who have absolutely no support for a Medicare for All plan, plan but those independents uh, those people who are, who are actually in the middle who feel a moral responsibility to health care uh, for whatever reason but but you get the idea those are the people that are what's called the movable middle and those are the people you can reach You're not going to reach the uh, uh, hardcore conservatives but you can reach reach the middle so what um, uh, he talks about, uh, Dr. Berger talks about, is finding the zones of acceptance. And, and that is finding, you know, what's between the 30-yard lines or the 40-yard lines on an individual issue. So it may not be Medicare for all, but it may be expanding Medicaid coverage or uh, a Medicare buy-in for younger people or the unemployed, what have you. But, but you get the idea. It may not, there may not be a zone of acceptance for uh, full transformation of the medical system, healthcare system, uh, but there might be zones of acceptance. There might be issues where you can find people, get them on your side, and then work on the rest later, but at least start it. Um, and how do you do that? Well, deep canvassing, creating empathy, uh, you know, telling stories about people who've been affected in the healthcare uh, system. And again, if you're a doctor or a nurse or a social worker, you have these stories and you have lots of these stories so that's not hard getting them out is a different story and that's part of my idea for the commission but uh, we have to get those stories out and uh, his other point is to avoid the region of rejection and in uh, in this case probably for people beyond the uh, 40 yard line to the other side that may be uh, medicare for all or single payer or government run health care if you want to call it that um, but when you start down that cognitive path, that's the region of rejection, right? That's they're going to out of hand dismiss you, put up their reactants, and immediately start thinking of reasons why you're wrong. So you have to avoid going there. Uh, and what you need to do is find the movable middle. You need to find either the issue or the message or um, something that is... Uh, is less unacceptable, right, to the people you're trying to persuade. Again, that's going to require a lot of research to, to figure that out. Uh, it's going to require research to figure out what the good messages are, uh, the workable messages are, and also to find out who the targets are, who is persuadable. Uh, is it going to be religious people who remember uh, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, or is it going to be uh, uh, atheists who uh, can be moved from uh, the market norms to the social norms, libertarians, I guess I should say. Um, the other thing he suggests is to ask for less. Uh, so maybe instead of asking for an entire overhaul, overhaul of the system with uh, uh, Medicare for all in one fell swoop, maybe ask for Medicare buy-in uh, for 60 to 65 or Medicaid uh, purchase, etc. whatever, uh, but you get the idea. But you don't have to ask for the whole hog <clears throat> all at once. You can ask for uh, ask for it piecemeal. This is less satisfying, I know, but if it moves the ball down the field, so be it. Um, switching the field is uh, the concept of getting people to 
not be in their uh, bunkers and have conversations and particularly to uh, to do to, to foment what's called active processing in other words instead of just automatically rejecting what you say you know at the doorstep with the uh, with the canvasser talking to to the uh, target instead of having them actively reject your uh, reject you out of hand have a conversation that makes them actually think and makes them actually think about their uh, their their approach and maybe change their mind maybe create a little empathy maybe uh, point out some things that will let them have agency remember agency and freedom to change their minds and to uh, maybe agree oh well you know maybe medicare buy-in would be a good thing like that um, finding the zones of acceptance is you know, essentially uh, the opposite of avoiding the rejection zones, right? So we're trying to find things that people could agree with. Um, Ann Applebaum, I'll put a reference to this, uh, makes the argument that we should appeal to patriotism. Uh, and I won't go into too much about it, but Danielle Allen, who wrote a book on the uh, reading of the Declaration of Independence, talks about how the Declaration appeals to not just freedom, but freedom and equality. And that without equality, Freedom is uh, not freedom. Uh, Edwin Chemerinsky wrote a book about the Constitution, interpretation of the Constitution in a progressive way, and you know promoting the general welfare is right there at the top of the things the Constitution is supposed to do. Um, I argue about the Golden Rule. Um, you know, there's a terrible puritanical streak in American politics, and um, it it harms us. It, it harms us a lot. Um, you know, every religion, every philosophical school in the world has some version of the golden rule, pretty much, right? Um, the only two exceptions, I argue, are uh, Anne Rand and her objectivism, and uh, often, sadly, uh, modern evangelical Christianity in America uh, seem to often just reject that rule, at least as it applies to population uh, in general, uh, they might apply the golden rule in individual circumstances, but it is not a uh, pervasive, overarching phenomenon for them. Uh, so, you know, I, I routinely quote Matthew 25, uh, whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, uh, as a reason that we should be thinking about doing the right thing here. But the puritanical streak in American politics is uh, deep and, and broad. And uh, I'll try to put a reference uh, down below about that if you want to read more about it. So <clears throat> on the left, you see some of the um, uh, cognitive uh, psychology issues with getting people to change their minds. Uncertainty, loss aversion, risk aversion, status quo bias, and, and we've talked about these. And how do you overcome those? Um, uh, Dr. Berger has a chapter called uh, uh, about unpausing and about getting people to take their foot off the brakes, right? So they, they've made their, uh, uh, they put on the brakes, they're not going to go any further, they're not going to come with you, they're, they're not going to join the cause. And how do you get them to uh, unpause and maybe take their foot off the brake at least a little bit? So one of his uh, business uh, arguments is to harness freemium, uh, like Dropbox having a free service. I, I, if anybody can think of a freemium application to healthcare, I'd love to hear it. I haven't been able to come up with one, but I put it in there for completeness because it's in the book. Uh, the next way to unpause people is make it painless. Reduce the upfront costs. Uh, for example, if you become unemployed, you are automatically enrolled in Medicare or Medicaid at no cost to you. It's just part of part of the social safety safety net, right? What that does is one, it makes it painless, but it also drives discovery. <clears throat> and by drive discovery, it means that you're going to let that person who's had employer-based health insurance uh, for a decade let them see what it's like to be on Medicare and it drives discovery of what Medicare would be like or what Medicare for all would be like or Medicaid, what have you, or a public option for that matter. And then also make it reversible. So you've tried the uh, Medicare while you're unemployed 
um, and then you get another job or you start a business, you can either keep it or you can go back to what you were doing before or buy insurance on the exchange or what have you, but, but it's reversible. And that's much less uh, fear provoking, making something reversible. Yes, you can come into Medicare, you're only 40 years old, but we're gonna let you go on Medicare because you're unemployed. Knowing that when they're employed again, they get another option for uh, healthcare insurance, they can uh, reverse this decision. It's, it's a great tactic. Um, and then use inertia endowment because once you've gotten the Medicare, maybe you like it. And if you like it, it is now yours and you have now endowed it uh, with that special sauce that, that makes, makes it yours and, and you want to keep it. And once you have it and once you uh, like it, at least to a degree, inertia, meaning having to change it, will make you more likely to keep it. You're more likely to just stick with the status quo. There's a whole set of behavioral economic research about that kind of thing. But you get the idea. Once you have it and it's working great, you might just keep it, right? I mean, you could go on the exchange or you could go back to your employer-based health insurance. But if this is working, why? Um, and I, I think I added this myself, is use uncertainty. And by that, I mean um, look at what is available around the world uh, in Germany, in France, for example, and cause some uncertainty about sticking with what you have. Um, um, so you have an employer-based health insurance and a, a deductible of $2,500 or, or what have you. And if you can inject into the conversation the idea that, well, you know, they don't have that in Germany, they don't have that in France, uh, their out-of-pocket costs are X, and you get the idea. Um, they don't have a maximum limit. They, you, you get it. So uh, that would, to me, would be using uncertainty and helping people unpause. Ah, okay, corroborating evidence. Yeah, let's see here. Ah, here we go. Uh, corroborating evidence. So um, once you've gotten the rest of everything you know in hand uh, you've gotten all the other uh, things that I've been talking about in hand then it becomes important to have corroborating evidence uh, sources that can corroborate what you're saying so for example you're doing deep canvassing and you talk to somebody about universal health care and they're looking at you and they're thinking well why why should I believe you well if you can apply some corroborating evidence other sources uh, to verify what you're saying or to validate what you're saying, that is very important. And what are the type of corroborating evidence sources that are meaningful to people? Well, as you can see here, they want to hear from people like them. They also want to hear from people who are not like them. They want, want some diversity in the opinion. So they don't want all people who work at the same job with them in the same pay grade, etc. They want people like um, uh, people who are in, in healthcare, a nurse, for example, right? Uh, they like people that they know. So if their cousin is a nurse or a social worker and can corroborate what, what you're saying, that's a very powerful source. People who are respected in the community. Nurses and doctors are great for this, right? We are respected in the community. Nurses more than doctors, but we're, we're all up there. So if you can have corroborating sources like us, that's very helpful. Organizations are helpful too. You know, the AMA has been directly op opposed to universal health care for decades, uh, except for lip service, frankly. Um, but if the AMA came around, that would be a big deal, right? Uh, there are other uh, physician organizations, nurse organizations, and other organizations uh, that can be very helpful providing corroborating evidence. So those are just a few of the uh, sources. Sorry, I'm gonna go back up, back up here a little bit. Uh, okay, well, we'll have to work on this slide set. So then the other question is how do you uh, deliver corroborating evidence? Uh, when do you deliver it and how do you deliver it? Um, 
just to give a background, Dr. Berger talks about uh, uh, about changing people's minds on things that are boulders and things that are pebbles. Uh, pebbles are getting people to change their uh, brand of toothpaste. Uh, boulders are universal health care, other big things like that. And what he talks about is how much how much evidence do you need to move a pebble versus a boulder? And he gives the example of a sprinkler versus a fire hose. You can move uh, pebbles with a sprinkler, but uh, uh, requires a fire hose to move a boulder. So, um, so when and how do you give the evidence? Do you give it all at once? He gives the example of an intervention where everybody you know comes and tells you that you need to quit abusing drugs or whatever, whatever it is. And sometimes that's a very effective tool, having everybody come at once, because that's sort of a boulder to get somebody to uh, change their life, essentially. Uh, so in, in the case of healthcare, don't think we can do all at once, but we can try to get an approximation of all at once. Um, the other op option is closely spaced asks. In other words, you know, ask something and then come back and very uh, quickly and ask it again and ask it again, uh, obviously without becoming a pest, but closely spaced asks as opposed to asks spread out over months are more effective. So it's more effective to do this close together. And my question is, can we apply, apply the fire hose strategically? And again, that'll go back to my argument about a, a, a a healthcare in America commission where we bring people together in a limited geographic area with great corroborating evidence with great evidence and bring that all into a single space and that may be these days of COVID uh, maybe uh, an online form after COVID maybe it'll be a hearing room uh, in, a, in a hotel or a, a university conference room or something like that I'm going to explore that more later, but I uh, and, and I won't um, cover it now. But it, it's something that's been percolating around in my mind for a long time about how do we <clears throat> how do we do this? Um, you know, all too often we speak to the choir, we go to conferences and speak to people who think like we do, and that that's just not going to get it done. Um, Ann Applebaum, and and again I'll put this reference below, makes the point that. Uh, it's very useful to get people who were on the same side as your opponents who've come over to your side, um, the disillusioned. So Wendell Potter comes to mind, worked for the healthcare industry forever, uh, came over to single payer side, universal healthcare side, and he's a very effective advocate because he was one of them, so to speak. Um, Republican voters against Trump, the Lincoln Project, those are also great examples, right? People who are on the same team as you who've changed their mind and they've changed it vigorously. And so those are useful corroborators because they were once part of your community and maybe they still are part of your community, but they've clearly changed their mind on, on certain issues. Um, I think there's a lot of disillusioned people in the medical industrial complex, be it in health plans, pharma, uh, uh, whatever there's there's a whole book uh, <laughs> book of people a rogues gallery so those are useful uh, corroborators people who are uh, no longer in opposition but are now on your side okay so all right I think that I have covered pretty much all I wanted to cover. Um, the only other thing is to say is that there are people, and I'll just go through this real quickly, there are people who have come across from the other side, and this is uh, the conservative case for universal health care, and this was from an article in 2017, and I'm, I'm not going to read this. I'll throw the slides up here, and you can pause and read them. But basically, this is a conservative making the case for universal health care and why it makes sense. So let me go to the next slide. Um, you know, it, it points out the obvious to us, right? The, among first world countries, the U.S. is a public health disaster zone. Um, uh, strange as it may seem to the American right, $600 EpiPens are not the sought after goal of conservatives in other countries. So, move this up for a second so you can pause it. 
and he presciently says, so even if there's some Banshee GOP resistance at first, Universal Medicare will swiftly become about as controversial as government-run fire departments. And uh, again, a few interesting uh, remarks here. And uh, so the response, this was in the American Conservative magazine, and so the response from the readers was fairly predictable. The reactants went up, right? Nobody's going to listen. They're immediately going to figure out why you're wrong and they're right. Um, good gravy, embarrassing. Venezuela reaches the final stages of socialism. No toilet paper um, is, is the funny guy's comment. And the, uh, this is another comment. The writer appears to assume that our political system is somehow responsive to the wishes uh, and best interests of the American people. And that sounds like Uwe Reinhardt. And someone said, this is the dumbest, most ignorant column I have ever read. Get the government out of my health care, the usual. But as you can see, it, it's not going to be easy. And you know, we've known that for decades, right? Uh, okay. Um, Finally, this is uh, some quotes from Kahneman and Tversky. These were the guys that first came up with uh, the behavioral economics called prospect theory at the time. And some of the important things are we don't choose between things. We choose between descriptions of things. Um, so universal health care, for example, is a thing, but it's how we describe it that makes people think how it determines how people think about it. So framing messaging is critically important to everything we do. Uh, I put the Tversky quote there just because I think it's funny. We study natural stupidity, not artificial intelligence. And this is the systems one versus systems two thinking, right? We think with our gut and we're not very good about it a lot of times. And uh, this is also important, uh, and this is talking about narratives, which I didn't get really into very much, but no one ever made a decision because of a number they needed a story. And um, I, I think we all know that in this community now, and I see a lot of initiatives about how to tell stories. Uh, but we have to tell stories, we have to get them in front of people, we have to have a conversation about the stories. We can't just present the stories, we have to talk about the stories and what they mean. So the bottom lines to all this are we need to reduce reactants, you know, the immediate opposition, by encouraging people to persuade themselves, and you do that by having a conversation. We need to shrink the distance between where we want to be and where the opposition is. And if that means Medicare buy-in uh, for 60 to 65 for now, or if it means temporary <clears throat> Medicaid expansion for people who are unemployed due to COVID, fine. Whatever it takes to get the baby steps to get us there. Um, we can't be so uh, pure of heart that we think there's only one solution and only one way to get there and expect people to just listen to us. They're not going to. Uh, reduce uncertainty by providing information, sure, but also providing safety. And part of the safety is reversibility, if, if that needs to be. Um, but you have to provide them assurance that things will be okay. You have to provide them assurance that <clears throat> people who once thought like them have now changed their minds and think that we need to do this and so on. Uh, providing corroborating evidence, and I think that's our job, and I'm speaking as a physician uh, and a healthcare professional, I think that's at least partially or maybe predominantly our job to make this case. It also requires our stories about patients and stories from patients themselves, and also requires to get these messages out. And whether that's going to be through uh, Zoom, sem Zoom seminars or YouTube or what have you, we have to figure out a better way of doing it. We're not doing a very good job now. And the important thing when you're talking with somebody is to keep asking how their needs might be different from ours. Um, and again, this is part of the conversation and the deep canvassing is that, well, why are you opposed to, you know, uh, Medicare for all or universal health care, what may be the puritanical thing, the deserved, undeserving poor and, and so on. Uh, but it may be something else. It may be something more practical that you can work out and talk out and have them, again, change their own minds, actively process uh, uh, the, the subject, and maybe come to a different conclusion at the end. And I'll finish with Uwe Reinhardt, uh, because I always think that the uh, uh, moral uh, uh, question is very important. And he said, a common incantation during debates on healthcare reform is that we all want the same thing. We just disagree on how to best get there. That is rubbish. 
And he's right. There are way too many Americans who absolutely do not want universal health care. And that is a topic for another lecture. Actually, if you go to my lecture on the three books lecture in this YouTube channel, I have a lot of discussion about this and the moral case and a lot of other things that I've just touched on here. I really wanted to get the cognitive uh, structure out in this lecture. And so thank you for joining me. I think that's all I got. All right. Have a good day.